started. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for this uh, chapter leader webinar on Fulbright in the Classroom. It's a, a delight to be with you. I'll start with my many thanks to this community for all the work that you do throughout the year to advance our mission, to give honor to our community, and to engage uh, with alumni and the community around you. Thank you so much. I'm also glad to be part of this webinar series. I know that Christine has been hosting a series uh, that has been well received and I hope it's meeting your needs. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about Fulbright in the Classroom. Uh, many of you are already familiar with this program. Some of you have already volunteered as volunteers uh, as with Fulbright in the Classroom and I'm grateful to you for that. Um, but uh, today we're going to give you some updates and some new opportunities uh, available to you and your chapter members. So, of course, we are building on a tradition during this 75th anniversary year, a tradition of storytelling by Fulbrighters. They've always, we've always shared uh, stories uh, with our friends, our families, our students, our colleagues, um, so Fulbright in the Classroom is quite consistent with that uh, tradition. We began this program in 2017, first as a chapter program, then we allowed volunteers to set on their own. Now it's a sort of a hybrid between the two. What's new this year are a couple of things. One, of course, because of the pandemic, we're asking people who are volunteering for Fulbright in the Classroom to do that digitally, to reach out to classrooms and connect to them through Zoom uh, primarily, uh, and that has been working uh, very well. The second is that we have a new grant program uh, to which chapters may apply. Uh, you can apply as a chapter or you can apply as, uh, as an individual. We'll get more into that uh, a little bit later. Uh, as part of our general strategic plan and as part of our mission, uh, we are focusing more of Fulbright in the Classroom on underrepresented communities um, as a way to expand the reach of the Fulbright program and down the road to encourage a wider range of people to apply. It's also worth noting the State Department, which is joining us in many activities re regarding the 75th anniversary, is supporting a, um, an, another um, Fulbr uh, Fulbright Classroom project, which you can find out more about uh, on our website, um, so uh, but that's worth that's worth noting. Okay, uh, in order to make this program go, there are some challenges, but there are also some terrific results. Um, the first is that this is a volunteer-driven program. The logistics of arranging classroom visits digitally, and then we hope in the fall, in a more hybrid fashion. That is on the shoulders of our volunteers. The Fulbright Association's uh, staff is, is too limited, too small to manage all of these ourselves. So we need to lean on you. So you make the arrangement to uh, uh, connect to a class and then uh, you develop your own presentation using the toolkit that we have available on our website. So if you go to Fulbright, uh, org slash Fulbright in the Classroom, you'll find many resources. I'll go over more of them in just a minute. The impact, of course, can be felt terrifically within your own community. And the fact that you are owning this yourself allows you to have that impact uh, yourself within a tailored outreach to your community. And finally, the freedom to do this on your own allows it to tailor it to your story, to your experience, to your expertise. So who is the audience and what is the content of a Fulbright in the Classroom outreach? Well, first we're think we have expanded this audience to, at first we were limiting this to K to 12 classrooms in your area. And now we're, we're, uh, we're urging you to think about Title I schools uh, that serve underrepresented uh, communities um, in your neighborhood, in your area. But we've also expanded it to reach college students, specifically those uh, at community colleges and minority serving institutions like HBCUs. The presentation itself is focused on uh, sharing your love and knowledge of a specific country 
not really talking about your research or your project. That's a good excuse uh, to be in front of students, but we really like you to talk more about the country that you were part of, that you visited, or that you're from if you're a visiting Fulbrighter. So that means focusing on the personal, the cultural, the geographic, teaching people about the, about the country itself. Your role or your, uh, your project while you were a Fulbrighter is really an excuse in this case to travel and learn. And what you're doing is sharing that learning with, uh, with students here in the United States. It's also worth noting that this effort will raise the profile of the Fulbright program, but it's not specifically a recruitment program. This is not something uh, our alumni are particularly well suited for, may not know that much about the application process, for example, but you can talk about how transformative this experience was and share it with others. There are several different options to participate in Fulbright in the classroom, and this is a little bit of a change since the last time you may have checked in on this program. The first is that you could volunteer. Now, this is what we've been doing all along. You can do this on your own, go where you like, present as often as you like, build your own network, reach out to teachers and professors on your own. You could do this once, you could do it multiple times, whatever makes you happy and makes you feel like you're contributing to the mission. We have this new option, which is to apply for a $750 grant. Now, this is made possible through the Van Otterloo Foundation, uh, uh, to which we are very grateful. And we are going to be asking individuals or chapters to apply for this grant by May 1st. So in this case, and we'll, again, more details in a minute, but the general idea is that you put together a proposal either as an individual or as a team of chapter members. The stipend as an individual would go to you in, in order to compensate you for your time. It could go to the chapter itself if you decided to apply as a team. Either way, you're going to be offering three presentations to underrepresented students in your area or beyond. There's no particular geographic restriction here. As I mentioned, apply by May 1st, learn by June 1st, and then, uh, and then execute this particular plan in the fall. Now, of course, you could do both of these. You could volunteer and you could apply for the grant. If you don't get the grant, you could still do it. There's no particular restriction. All you need to be is a member of the FA and you already are. In just a minute, I'm going to pause to uh, ask uh, questions so you can put your question or answer questions. You can put those in the Q&A and Christine will share uh, those questions with me and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, but as you think about those questions, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, go to Fulbright.org slash Fulbright in the classroom. You'll see lots of resources there. On that homepage, you'll see an introduction, we'll talk about the process. You'll see a recording of a workshop I did quite similar to this a week or so ago. On the, on the FIC FAQ page, lots of good questions answered there about how much experience you have to have, what the content is, do you bring in photos to this? There are lots of uh, good things to explore there. On the Fulbright in the Classroom Toolkit, you'll see templates for reaching out to teachers and professors. You'll see the Fulbright in the Classroom logo, which you can use as part of your presentation. There are forms, there's ways, there are lesson plans, lots of tools available to you because again, this is a volunteer driven program. You take a look at it, you drive this program forward and the digital resources are there for you. There is a Fulbright in the Classroom grant uh, website as well. Now here is where you'll get all the details about the mission and the focus of the grant program itself, forms to fill out the application process. Uh, after the question and answer break, we'll get uh, more into that. Uh, and of course, you can always email us classroom at fulbright.org, or you could write to Christine, Christine at fulbright.org, or you could write directly to me, John at fulbright.org. Okay, uh, Christine, we'll go ahead and take questions now. Why don't you 
uh, share any that there might have popped up. Um, and uh, we'll do a couple of those and then we'll move on to the second half of the presentation. Sure, so we have a question for you. Um, can you discuss what is meant by underrepresented students? Absolutely. So in this case, underrepresented is when you look at the profile of the Fulbright program, you find that um, there are groups that are not well represented. These would be students of color. These would be students from rural areas. Um, many states in the middle part of the country are underrepresented. Uh, it's, it's a program that has been uh, a little too elitist, I will tell you, over the years and not properly captured all of who we are as a people. So we are trying to do a wider outreach uh, to those kinds of communities. That does not mean that a community that may not fit that profile is not worthy of your time. Of course, it's, it's worthy. Uh, so uh, it's just that we are hoping to emphasize outreach to those populations that have not typically participated in Fulbright. Okay, great. And a quick follow up to that would very rural low income school districts qualify as underrepresented? Absolutely, absolutely. So when think about this, that when Americans go overseas with a Fulbright, they are citizen ambassadors, and they have something to teach everyone that they meet and touch and, and learn from and so on. So the question is, what are they sharing? What are they learning? In this case, as you've just mentioned, someone from a rural uh, community has a lot to share about what it's like to be an American from, from a rural part of our country. Uh, so absolutely, that's, that would qualify. Okay, great. And um, another question, does it matter how long ago we received our grant? Yeah, I, that's, that's a good question. I did my... Uh, Fulbright to India more than 30 years ago, which is a long time ago. Um, it, it is reasonable to ask someone who's been that far removed from their experience at a, in a country, whether they really have a sense of that country anymore. I think this is up to you. If you feel comfortable talking about it, great. If you feel like you've been, uh, you've kept a relationship with that country, that's fine too. I frankly think that Every Fulbrighter, no matter how long ago it was, has something to contribute. You mostly have to think about your audience. So if your audience is a, a college audience, there might be more sophisticated questions that you may have lost track of. But if you're giving a presentation to a middle school, well, frankly, uh, whatever you have would be a great addition. Um, okay, another question. Should we send the info of fix that have already occurred to a certain place or person? Um, as in, do you want to keep account of all fix that have been completed? Yes, excellent, important question. I'll reemphasize this several times. There is a form on the Fulbright uh, in the classroom toolkit that is a reflection form. And we ask that everybody who does this, even if you only do it once, please fill that out. It's so important that we learn from you. We always want to improve this program as it goes, but we also want to know that it's happened. Uh, sometimes these things happen and we never know about it. Um, we also want to share your story. Let's say you've had a really great experience. We'd love to share that story with others. This is a moment for celebration and reflection. So yes, please fill out that reflection form every time you do this. Great. Um, this is a two part question. One, how many grants are available? And two, are there any limitations to how many applications will be funded per Fulbright Association chapter? Um, no, let's go backwards. There's no restriction on the number of grants that could go to a single chapter because we'll be thinking of these um, as individual proposals, okay? There will be 23 grants available at $750 each. That's not a lot of money, but it's a good amount of money. Um, we'll talk more about how you apply as a chapter in a moment. Okay, and another clarifying question, is there a preferred grade or age level? No preference. Um, um, my feeling is whatever is a comfortable audience for you. There are lots of uh, Fulbright scholars, for example, tenured faculty 
who have worked most of their life teaching college and graduate students. They would not be comfortable in an elementary classroom. On the other hand, there are those who have a lot of experience with younger children who would feel much happier there and feel that they could really get uh, a large, <coughs> a strong reaction. So I think the, the guide is whatever fits you, whatever makes you comfortable and to which you think you can do a great job. Okay, great. And this is the last question for this for this round of questions. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but maybe you could elaborate. Is the goal to solicit applications for Fulbright fellowships or to inform students about different countries around the world? Excellent question. It is really the second part, uh, to inform students about countries around the world. It is an ancillary benefit, a secondary one, maybe even a tertiary one that somewhere down the road and that road could be this fall, that they apply for the Fulbright. But we all know that not everyone can win a Fulbright. It's a competitive process, but everyone can learn. Everyone can be more informed about countries around the world. And so we think that the first mission should be international education. If, if, stu if students feel inspired to apply for a Fulbright, great, and we'll encourage that. But there are so many ways to have an international life. We don't want this to just be about applying for a Fulbright. Okay, so Christina, I think I'll move on. Um, I know that I believe you can still see my PowerPoint, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so the question becomes, how do I do this? How do I make this happen? Uh, so we're gonna go through a couple of steps to put this together. And of course, we'll again, talk about the grant application itself. So the first step is actually the most challenging. Where do I go? Uh, what do I, <laughs> I, you know, I like this idea of talking about India to middle schoolers, but where do I find them? Well, first you need to think, as was just discussed, think about your institutional or audience focus. So uh, are you more comfortable with middle schoolers? That's great. But make up your mind about what audience you want to hit or what kind of institution you wanna reach. So say a local community college. Here in my county, there are a number of really great community colleges. Once I've decided that's what I wanna do, that will make it easier to figure out where to go next. The next thing is to use the respective websites of these institutions, schools, colleges, et cetera, to research uh, faculty that can partner with you. A faculty partner is so critical as a liaison to between you and in the institution. Uh, you can look for a relevant particular faculty, those who teach languages, those who teach social sciences, those who specialize in your area of uh, expertise or have a particular interest in that country that you've gone to. You'll see in the toolkit a template on to, to use for contact, but of course you're welcome to modify that and use that as appropriate to you and your mission. You'll want to reach out to faculty to explain who you are, what you're trying to do, what kind of content you would want to deliver to their student, work with them on access. So, you know, timing, when are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? Um, as I said, for the most part, these will be digital presentations, probably even into the fall, but given the rate of uh, vaccines uh, being given, uh, chances are it could be in person in the fall. But you'll want to think about that uh, as you either arrange for something this spring as a volunteer or in the fall as a grant applicant. All right, so let's say you've worked this out with a, a couple of faculty members at a local school or college. Now you need to think about your presentation itself. So again, remember your audience. Uh, a how you deliver this and how engaging it is, what kinds of exercises you do depend on who you're talking to. Uh, as I've mentioned, remember to focus on the country itself, on the personal, the cultural. What happened as you traveled? What was the impact of your experience? Uh, a lot of our FIC um, volunteers talk about uh, favorite cuisines that they had, an adventure they went on, a religious holiday that they enjoyed, that they learned so much from. What is unique about that, that country and how does it differ or is the same to what it is that we experience here in the United States? Uh, 
you'll want to consider what kinds of assets you want to gather. So, so many of us have photographs from our time as a Fulbrighter. You'll want to think about that. More recent graduates, of course, have video that they took while they were doing. Um, just think about bottom line is, what is it that you could share about your time overseas or the country that that you just couldn't just find on, you know, on some easy website to make it real, to make it personal, to come make it come alive. Step three is the visit to the classroom itself, telling your story to the classroom. So remember, of course, to introduce yourself, explain something about why you're there, some basics about the Fulbright program. Again, this is not a recruitment program, just, you know, how were you sent overseas under what circumstance? And then, of course, talk about the country that we're, that uh, is your focus. Try to keep it interactive. This is not just a dull, boring uh, lecture. You want to ask questions. You want to be sure you're addressing their uh, needs as you go. Uh, depending on the age category, you can take photographs or a screenshot. You'll want to think about that because, of course, if that's for K to 12, there are permissions that need to be secured. And of course, the most important thing is for you to have fun. Your students will have fun too. Finally, as follow-up, <clears throat> you'll want to think about what to do next. Of course, thank everybody who helped you make it possible. Ask the faculty partner that you have about suggestions for continuing to engage with them. This may be a one and done, and that's fine. That is fine. But it may also be the start of a relationship that you have with that faculty and that class, and, and that's up to you and, and, of course, up to them. Complete the reflection. Uh, one of the good questions earlier was filling out that form. Again, that's, it's a, it'll just take a few, a minute or two, but it's very important to help us learn what happened, where did you go, and how could the program learn from your experience. We're, we're a learning uh, institution. We're trying to make it better all the time. Share the photographs with our office. Send it to classroom at fulbright.org or to christine at fulbright.org. And finally, inspire a friend. Let's say you had a great, well, I hope you had a great experience. Please share that with another Fulbrighter, perhaps in your chapter or on your chapter board, and say we'd love to have you participate. All right, a couple more slides, and then we'll get back to your questions to finish out this, uh, this webinar today. I mentioned that the Van Otterloo Foundation uh, uh, funded this grant program. We're grateful to them. I also mentioned 23 of these $750 presentations. So the question here is that as a chapter, you could apply for one of these grants as a team. Uh, we'll get even further into this, but basically you're going to do the same application that an individual would do, but you'd present yourself as a team. As a team, you would be telling us specifically what are you going to do, where you're going to go, what teachers you've partnered with. So the proposal itself needs to be detailed and specific. And you would, therefore, as a team, be able to cover at least three presentations. I mentioned before that we're hoping for outreach to Title I, K-12 schools, community colleges, MSIs. Again, I'm repeating myself, but apply by May 1st, learn by June 1st, uh, by, learn by June 1st and present in the fall. Of course, we hope you'll participate regardless of the outcome and that what you do will make us better as we go. Okay, let's dig even further into this. So you'll want to contact faculty at whatever level it is, make that contact, set this up, start this. The proposal itself has to capture those details. You can't just say, I'm interested in reaching out to middle schools in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Of course, that's fine, but we need to know which schools that you've actually got something concrete to share with us. That will be important for your 500 word or less proposal. Okay, so how does that work? What's it going to look like? What are you going to present on? Help us to see what this will look like and where you will go. Specifics matter, just like they mattered to your Fulbright application. Just remember that. 
in the personal statement, again, if you were doing this as a team, this, this is going to be a bit of an editorial challenge, but the th two or three of you will want to uh, edit this together and speak as a team about uh, who you are, what was your Fulbright or your Fulbrights about, what inspired you to, to apply for this particular grant. Two letters of recommendation are needed. This could be one from each of you. Um, we're trying to be flexible to adapt what has started as an individual program to fit a, a chapter uh, audience. And I'm really excited that chapters could apply. So please, please do that. And then uh, submit all of this uh, to the letters of rec, go to the classroom at fulbright.org and the other forms are submitted electronically. Okay, so I'll wind this down and take a few, uh, more questions, as many as you have, but I wanna thank you for your time and your interest in doing this, encouraging your chapter members to do this, either as individuals or as teams, so important. Getting the word out for this is, is really critical and I appreciate your help with that. Of course, if you're applying yourself, I'm, I'm grateful to you as well. Doing this joins and extends a tradition within the Fulbright community, one that's very important. Whenever I talk to uh, folks on Capitol Hill, uh, in the State Department, others, they're so supportive of this idea that alumni are giving back, are sharing their knowledge and expertise and love of the international with students is, is so exciting to them. It's such a great extension of the Fulbright mission. It's a fairly young program and it is abstract, but uh, we have built this program on the hard work of chapters like in Iowa and Indiana and Georgia and California. Uh, lots of folks have been involved in this and helped us learn to do this better. Your imagination, your creativity, your initiative, make it work. Your, your stories make it go and your feedback makes it better. So many thanks to all of you for, for this. Uh, Christine, we'll go ahead and uh, take uh, as many questions as you like. Um, uh, happy to happy to do that. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I've got two right here. So the first one is, can you discuss a region, um, for example, Eastern Europe, as opposed to one country? Sure, sure. I, I have no problem with that. The the issue here is is sharing the international and doing it in a way that's personal and educational and substantive. Uh, if you've had uh, uh, extensive experience, say, in the Balkans, and you want to talk about various countries in the Balkans, that's great. Um, particularly, say, if the course is on Balkan politics or history. But even if it weren't, the contrast between these countries can be really very interesting. Um, I spent time in South Asia being able to compare India to, to Pakistan to Sri Lanka, to Bangladesh, et cetera. These are interesting comparisons to be made. Um, so sure, a regional discussion would be, sounds like a great idea. Okay, great. And um, could the benefit um, and the presentation also focus on the benefits of international education and study abroad? Again, not specific to one country. Well, I, th I think that, of course, the mission of international study and study abroad are, are going to be advanced. You're, let's say you go and talk about your time in Brazil uh, or just in general, your life international. Uh, I think that that's, that's helpful, but I think um, to really to, to capture their interest, you want it to be pretty specific. I think if it's too vague or, uh, or just in general about how great the world is, um, that's a message that, uh, while true, is, is not particularly uh, interesting. I think the more detailed you get, the more personal you are, the more you tell your stories, your personal stories. Um, you know, I spent Easter with Mother Teresa years and years ago on my Fulbright. It's a, it was an amazing experience. So I could talk about charity and helping the poor, but to tell a story about work that I did in her center for a few days, that's a little bit more interesting. 
uh, I think. So don't get too general. Okay, great. Um, who should applicants get their letters of recommendation from? So this, this, is, um, this could vary a lot. This could be a colleague. This could be um, a, someone who was on a Fulbright with you. Um, that uh, it could be a Fulbright commission director. Um, there are all kinds of uh, possibilities here. I want to be flexible to, um, in this regard, because I know that if you're a, a working professional, you, it, it may not be obvious who to get a letter of recommendation from. So stay nice and focused on, on, um, on people that know that you would be engaged uh, and engaged well. Great. Um, as a chapter, would people be able to invite multiple presenters to take part in multiple presentations through the grant? Well, we can't, we couldn't give out more than the one grant. Uh, so uh, we're trying to keep this open to a lot of people rather than focusing a lot of resources on one grant, uh, on, on one set of presentations to one audience. On the other hand, if uh, if you're if you're willing to bring in more people and your faculty partner wants to wants to be part of that, that could be very exciting. It's just that the grant is limited, and so we wouldn't be able to give out multiple grants for for uh, one effort. Okay, great. This question is from Dolores. She um, is a professor whose research taught and worked in several countries. Um, only one of them, Ethiopia, was for a Fulbright grant. Would it be okay to present on countries in which she has taught and worked other than Ethiopia? Sure, sure. I mean, I, 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 I want to be respectful of and take advantage of the fact that so many of you have led Lives International and that you can draw from many experiences. Um, I, I think that Really, the Fulbright is the excuse to get in front of a classroom. If, if you can share experiences from multiple countries in a way that is exciting, accessible, appropriate to that audience, sure, um, no worries. I, I think the main theme I want to emphasize here that unifies the answers to these questions is we're flexible. We're interested in hearing proposals that will capture the strength of your uh, communities and, and, uh, and do it well. It's also worth remembering that you don't have to get this grant to do a presentation, right? You can still volunteer and, and do it on your own. So therefore, under those circumstances, there's a little more freedom, uh, provided that you're following the general mission and doing honor to, to, the, to, to the work. All right, well, that, those are all the questions that we have right now. If anyone has any questions, please quickly add them to the Q&A. There's also some things in the chat, I think, uh, Christine, that you might want to take a look at. While you're, while you're looking at that, um, uh, Alex uh, asked a question about my time with Mother Teresa. Um, Alex, I was in Calcutta um, at the time. Um, I went to her center to volunteer for about a week. And during that time, I was assigned to the men's side of, of her center there. And I took care of um, extraordinarily, um, uh, it was hard to describe how, how in terrible shape these men were, but I helped bathe them and cut their hair and give them shaves and spend time with them as best I could. Uh, and it just happened to fall during Easter week. And so um, I celebrated Easter with, uh, with Mother Teresa and, and a few volunteers. It was an amazing moment, a very holy one. Thank you for asking. All right, yeah, that, that's all. those are all the questions that I see. Um, there are some good resources in the chat though for people who have connections to community colleges and wanna get involved, um, specifically David Smith. So feel free to reach out to him. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. John, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, just uh, my gratitude to you, Christine, for uh, organizing this and for your leadership in our chapter community. And, uh, and, a, and a final thank you to all of you for both attending this and showing your interest. Um, 
uh, get out there, go do these things. Let us know how it goes. Let us know how we can help you. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, an exciting initiative, but it, it really depends on you, your leadership and time. And so we're grateful for all of that. So thank you very much for attending and we'll stay in touch. Yes, definitely. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Have a good day.